I appreciate you all coming. Uh, today's session will perhaps be a little different than some of them that you have attended. Uh, unfortunately, I will be using PowerPoint, so that puts it in line with other sessions you have attended. But I'm hoping to focus in on a number of laws today that most of you have to deal with and hopefully give you a slightly different understanding of those laws. In my practice, I constantly deal with legal departments and lawyers and releases of new laws and legal research. And I occasionally go online and read some of the articles that have been written about these provisions. And I am generally horrified by what's being written by attorneys who know absolutely nothing about the records management issues in these laws. And I'm sure you encounter the same sort of problem. Just because somebody is an attorney doesn't mean they know anything about laws affecting records management. In fact, there are many of you in this room who know a whole lot more. Just so you know where I'm coming from, besides being a lawyer and licensed in Colorado, I went to law school. We didn't spend one minute of three years discussing records management issues, records retention, legal requirements for electronic imaging. Well, didn't exist at that time. Legal requirements for microfilm at that time. Oh, some of you do remember microfilm. I'm going to come to a, a slide and we'll see if you remember the topic of that slide. And then I'll really show you your age if you do. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm hoping that we can talk about some additional skills. And the learning objectives that I presented for ARMA uh, are in the handouts. ARMA said that you can access all the handouts online, so we will assume that's the case. I have selected a few laws. There could be many more, but I tried to pick a couple that were basically things that most people had to deal with. You know, there's Dodd-Frank and Graham Leach Bliley and things you may have heard about, but that's a more limited audience. And I elected to avoid those. So what are some of the key laws I want to look at? Oldie but goodie. These are not new laws. But what I've elected to do is to take these laws, look at the current understanding, and then reapproach them with you as to what they really say and make suggestions, in my opinion, how you should implement it in your organization. So Sarbanes-Oxley, oldie but goodie. Not so old, but a goodie is the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act that many of you have to deal with. ERISA. The Employment Retirement Income Security Act, I apologize for using the abbreviation, it'll be spelled out in a later slide. And the Uform Electronic Transaction Act, I, there's such misconceptions as to what you can or cannot do. If time permits, I'd like to talk about my current favorite subject, which is federal preemption. If you don't know what that is, well, that may be okay because we may not get to it. <laughs> but only if time permits, uh, I will deal with it. Okay, Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Uh, some of you may know that I am blessed with triplets. Uh, some of you may have been in the session 24 years ago when they were born. <laughs> Uh, some of you even got to meet them in Denver uh, when the national conference was in Denver. Uh, for a while there, uh, when I put my kids to bed, we would, uh, you know, thank, uh, you know, everybody for the uh, wonderful day and everything. And I would add, uh, thank you, Mr. Sarbanes, and thank you, Mr. Oxley, for everything we have. 
because the mass hysteria that resulted from Sarbanes-Oxley has actually contributed a major part of our business. What happened? I'm going to have to get into a little bit of politics, and I, I, you may get where I stand politically. That's not my goal. My goal is to explain what led to this, what it means, and how to think about it and implement it. In the late 1990s to 2000, some of you may remember, during the Clinton administration, we had a major increase in the stock market. Uh, many of these were valueless stocks. The dot-com would come on the marketplace, people would buy it up, they're totally worthless, and the stock market would go up. You couldn't make a bad investment decision. All stocks went up all the time. And of course, uh, during the, the administration at that time bragged about how great the economy was as a result of all of this. Well, many of these companies creatively fabricated their financial statements. That is, saying it nicely. They committed fraud. And they got away with it. And thus, the value of their companies appeared much greater than they really were. Certified public accountants who were supposed to protect us participated in this audit deception. Examples of companies uh, that were involved during this period, some of you uh, looking out at the audience were a little too young to remember all of this, but Enron, Tyco, and Anderson, I'm going to focus a little bit on Enron and Anderson, as Arthur Anderson, and what transpired with them. They were selected to be the uh, CPA, Certified Public Accountants for Enron. And thus, they were doing the audit. But they had a $3 million audit contract with Enron and a $75 million consulting contract. Do you think they were nice during the audit <laughs> in order to keep the other business relationship? That was a problem. The audit reflected thus an overly positive view of the financial situation for Enron. Enron's stock rose artificially, and it was valued higher than it was in reality. It was just some background information, what led to the law, and thus what the legislators were trying to resolve as part of it. Arthur Anderson, by the way, uh, had a reasonable retention schedule, uh, identified records that could be destroyed after six years, had retention of essential information to support the audits that they were involved in. They had a retention schedule, like many of you do. Uh, they permitted destruction of drafts and notes and all non-final documents well before the end of the retention period. And they said no destruction if litigation was threatened. Well, they were wrong. <laughs> litigation was threatened. And the federal government was investigating not just Enron, but Arthur Anderson. So Arthur Anderson was under investigation for the Enron audit. And Anderson lawyers reminded Anderson employees to destroy records under the retention schedule. Now, I'm sure you all know that even if you have a retention schedule, when litigation is in progress or imminent, you may not destroy relevant records. Well, Anderson did destroy records, but they destroyed it under the retention schedule. And so please be aware from their experience that the retention schedule will not protect you during litigation, government investigation and audit, you may not destroy relevant records during those periods. Okay, so this made the investigation of this financial fraud much more difficult uh, for the Department of Justice. Therefore, Congress in 2002 uh, came up with Sarbanes-Oxley Act, named after uh, two representatives from both sides of the House, a Democrat and a Republican. President Bush came into office around this time, 
and selected a new director of the Security and Exchange Commission. It did not take that director more than six months to uncover this entire fraud. And it wasn't just Enron, wasn't just Anderson, it was all these dot coms. Most major corporations were lying through their teeth. They were making up numbers, stock market went up. The goal of the 2002 law was to improve the accuracy of the financial reporting. So when people ask you, why do we do all this stuff under Sarbanes-Oxley, please remember the history. Huge uh, fraud involved, deception, individuals, uh, organizations bought stock based upon false premises. The goal was to get accurate financial reporting and to restore confidence in the stock market. When you look at the financial performance of an organization, it is correct and you can base your investment decisions on that. What are the key provisions? And this now gets into the record keeping part. A new organization was created. The Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, most people refer to them as peekaboo. <laughs> they had a ooh at the end, you know, P-C-A-O-B, peekaboo. Uh, up to this point, certified public accountants were not regulated. So they were hired to review the finances of public companies and rule on the accuracy but nobody regulated the CPAs. And the purpose of this new federal corporation was to oversee them and set guidelines and rules to make sure they were doing their job. So they established a federal oversight of the public accountants. So if you're a public accountant fir firm, this is the first area where the regulation affects you. You now have all sorts of reporting, all sorts of other requirements you need to follow. The law also required the CEO and the CFO, Chief Financial Officer, to personally certify the accuracy of the financial statements. So now we had to have uh, the financial statements signed by not just the CEO and the CFO, and of course those records uh, need to be kept. This is what the press picked up on as the most important thing in Sarbanes-Oxley. It's just a minor thing in the process. Penalties. And the penalties made all the difference. There was a provision in there for a penalty of up to 20 years in prison for anybody who knowingly uh, altering, knowingly altering, destroying mutilating, concealing, covering up, or making false entry in any record with the intent to interfere with any government investigation or proper administration of any law. Therefore, if you have to file not just a financial statement, but any record with the federal government or state government, in this case, it would only apply to federal records, that if somebody's manipulating the information, creating false information, et cetera, deliberately to deceive, they can go to jail for 20 years. Now, pre prior to this, there was a statute on the books, but it related to the corporation. The corporation who uh, submits false information can be fined and penalized but no person would go to jail. Now they're saying people will go to jail for making improper records. This got the attention of the boards of directors because if the boards of directors approved the financial statements and they were false, there was a threat, it never happened, but there was a threat that they individually could go to jail. And all of a sudden, some of you may have been around at that time in 2002, there was a renewed interest in records management and 
especially records retention. Because the boards of directors then insisted that the legal departments review and confirm that the retention programs in their organizations comply with this legal standard. And thank you, Mr. Sarbanes, and thank you, Mr. Oxley. <laughs> What's the record keeping provisions that you have to implement? Again, if you're the public auditors, you have to confirm the accuracy of the corporate financial statements and you have to keep records of audits for seven years and the audit work papers. Many of you have heard this seven before. If you've heard me speak before, you read my books, etc., you know seven years is a myth for tax records, for example. There is no seven year requirement for tax records. But for some reason, when this provision was approved, it was adopted with a seven-year provision going to go along, I guess, with the rumor. It's best I can figure out. Notice the seven years does not apply to the corporation. It applies to the public auditors. What does the corporation have to do? Corporation has to maintain audit and accounting complaints. If somebody complains about your system, a whistleblower, you got to keep records. Years ago, there was a more explicit reference related to retention about keeping the records. And we interpreted this as the type of law you shall keep records, but no retention period is stated, so we generally interpreted that as three years. In the last few years, this was watered down as a, a, just a duty of the corporation. It was downgraded in terms of its importance. So I'm not sure if there's any particular retention you have to be concerned about. You have to manage the outside auditors, of course you've got to hire them and make sure they're doing their job. And then the big section 404 compliance for the annual audit. What does all this mean? You have duties to establish internal accounting controls for your accounting system and demonstrate those controls work. Huge, anybody deal with 404 compliance, it's a huge amount of record keeping. You have to show that every part of your financial record keeping system has procedures. The people working on those systems are trained and know what they're supposed to do. And each of those little components of the system work. Intake of bills to be paid works. Processing of those bills works. Entry into the computer works. Okay, if any of you have studied ISO 9000 standards on quality assurance, this is the same thing. It's quality assurance for financial record keeping. The auditors confirm the accuracy of the final financial uh, statement. You develop the controls and the records that show every step of the process works. You then give that data, that information to the public auditor. And the public auditor now rules on two things. The accuracy of the financial statement, the accuracy of the system. If any of you have read uh, other publications of mine related to how you make a legal system, part of the definition is you need three things. Procedures, training, and audit. Procedures tell you what you're supposed to do. In the Sarbanes-Oxley mode, it'll tell you uh, what should be happening. Training, if people know what they're supposed to do, there's a high likelihood they will do it. And audit confirms that things did in fact happen the way they were supposed to. So the public auditors confirm the accuracy of the financial system and reporting through traditional audits, review the corporate controls. 
And by the way, you be surprised that except for the public auditors, the corporation has no long-term retention requirement under Securities and Exchange Commission. I've paraphrased what 404 says. There is no long-term retention requirement in Sarbanes-Oxley for the corporation. So what do most of you do? Most of you will keep the record seven years or permanent, etc. Please go online, Google Sarbanes-Oxley, read the law. It's a miserable, boring law. <laughs> if your kids cannot go to sleep at night, read them Sarbanes-Oxley or read them one of my books. That will accomplish the same thing. The reality is it does not establish any long-term records retention requirements for the corporation. During the year, you review all these systems, you document the controls, the end of the year you give it to the auditor, you're done. I have had this discussion with so many financial people and corporations, they all agree with the interpretation. On the other hand, very few of them will do what I just described, throw the records out the next year. <laughs> That's a different problem. But the first part of the issue is a recognition of what's the legal requirement. And there is none other than keep it for the current year, give it to the auditor, and then you're basically done. And SEC, by the way, does not then come in and do the same type of review the public auditor does. They may do other things, but not the same type of audit or review, so you don't have to be worried about them. Okay, that's pretty much Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, questions? Anybody have a question or comment or? Yes, real loud. If you're privately held something, yes. 